Today I'm going to tell you how to do drugs right. I mean, how to do drugs research, right? It's a public health talk, and in it I'm going to tell you why it is that I do street-based research among heroin injectors, how to greater understand risk-taking behavior, and how to better inform interventions. For the first time in a hundred years, since the great influenza pandemic, 1918, life expectancy at birth for an infant born today has gone down three years in a row. Why is that? Because we are facing the worst drug crisis in modern history. Deaths due to drug overdoses now exceed deaths due to car accidents, gun violence, and even HIV at the height of the 1990s HIV epidemic. Now, to do research on drugs, no, I don't mean to take them. To do public health research in the drugs field, you have two big toolboxes. You've got quantitative approaches and qualitative approaches. On the quantitative side is epidemiology. It's going to give us the landscape view, the who, the when, the where. It's going to give us that graph we just saw in terms of time trends. But epidemiology has difficulty with context. It has difficulty with causal mechanism. For that, we need to go deeper. We need qualitative approaches like what I do, which is participant observation ethnography. It's a practice within cultural anthropology. We can go deeper, get context, and help answer the elusive why question or how questions. For that, we go down to the street. We go into the neighborhood where we're going to see the good of a place, the color, the vibrancy, the unusualness, and the quirkiness. And because, our work, because of the nature of our work, we're going to go to some of the darker places as well. We're going to go to the abandoned side of town, to its margins, into the abandoned buildings and the factories. And when I say into, I mean into. We're going to go up the stairs, we're going to go and observe the indoor shooting galleries and the outdoor consumption spaces. Mind the gap. And we look forward to getting out. That's me. We're going to go to the tracks. We're going to avoid the moving trains. Go down under the trestle to the encampment. Why do we go to these places? Because we know that if we go to the holes, we go to the edges, we go to the fault zones of society, we are going to see the riskiest drug use, and that's my job. How do we do this? We work as a team. This is my current team. That's Eliza, Mary, Jeff, and Fernando. We work together. We work collaboratively. We will interview folks in natural environments, on the streets. We're going to invert power as much as possible. We're going to get down to their level. We're going to treat them like experts and ask them about their lived experience. We're going to show our concern. We're going to give them our respect. We're going to ask questions without judgment because that builds rapport. That builds trust. We get shown stuff. We get taken places. We'll do some audio and video recording with permission. And along the way, we are intensely interested in following the drug. We want to know what it looks like, what it tastes like, what it acts like, what people like about it, what people don't like about the drug they were taking last year. Different forms of powdered heroin. This is a solid form of heroin called black tar. It is the hero of the story I'm going to tell next. We look at liquid forms. We look at new forms. This is fentanyl. It's the villain of the story following that one. We watch drug preparation and use, both on an individual level and a social level. We go deep by following the drug. Now, I'm going to give you um, two examples of how we do our research and what, what, it, what difference it's made. Um, one historic one from the HIV epidemic in the 1990s, and one more contemporary one of the current opioid overdose crisis. This is CDC data, Centers for Disease Control, on HIV prevalence, the proportion of a risk population that has the disease. This is the sexual risk population of MSM. In the blue bars, if we squint, we'll see that 
while these blue bars are unfortunately very high, HIV prevalence in the 90s is very high, they're relatively even across the country. Contrast this to, to HIV prevalence in the injection risk population, what do we see? Squint, we see much lower yellow bars on the West Coast. Why? Here's where we get to a why question. And why questions are something that qualitative research is going to shine at helping us with. Why did HIV not progress in the western half of the country as much as the eastern half in injectors? The answer is in those blackly shaded states which show the prevalence of black tar heroin. Now, black tar heroin, a lot of people don't realize that heroin comes in different chemical forms. And I've spent 20 years tracking down different sources, different forms of heroin, how they're used differently, and the different medical and public health consequences of them. Black tar heroin comes to the West Coast. It's been doing that for 30 years now. It comes from Mexico. Powdered heroin's to the East Coast. We mostly get this brown stuff from Colombia, but we used to get China white. We haven't seen much of it for 20 years. Now, Philippe Bogua and I worked on this HIV hypothesis uh, he came with me to, to me with the idea, and I've been working on it. I helped him solve it. We noticed that black tar heroin is a fussy heroin. People needed to heat it more than powdered heroin to go into solution. Heating kills HIV. We also noticed them ritualistically rinsing their syringes, and we asked, why are you doing that? Is it to prevent HIV? And they're like, no, 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 I just didn't want to use it later. They were being thrifty, and black tar heroin, if left in tiny residual in a syringe, will gum it up. Works are gummed up, no good. So thriftiness over hygiene. Here we have a chemical whose use, through ritualized heating and rinsing, prevented not only HIV at the individual level, transmission of HIV, but also half the country. What else are we learning? Let's give a contemporary example. This is the current opioid overdose crisis that is devastating parts of our country. I call it a triple wave epidemic, where deaths due to opioid pills in the first wave were exceeded by deaths in the second wave, heroin, building on the momentum of the first wave. And then the deadliest wave yet is synthetic opioids, such as fentanyl and its cousins. What have we learned in three years of ethnographic research? Multiple U.S. cities and towns uh, in the United States. Well, first off, let me tell you how devastating this is. And I could tell you, show you more graphs of statistics and stuff, but let me tell you one story. It's a story of Justin. He's 29 year old. We meet him in Charleston, West Virginia. He lives in a nearby smaller town. He's got a job. He's got a car. He's got a girlfriend. He injects heroin every day. He likes our project. We like him. We hang out with him for a few days. We're interviewing him. Along the way, he drops a bomb. Just came back from his 10th high school reunion. Small town, everyone knows everyone's business. Half his class is missing. Half his class has died. Why? Overdose. Pills, heroin, fentanyl. Another insight is that the heroin product itself is changing. The stuff that's sold on the street as heroin is morphine. This classic triptych is going away, and we're seeing new forms, more white powder than we've ever seen in 20 years. Gray stuff. And while some of the heroin looks normal, a lot of it ain't. This ain't heroin, and this yellow stuff ain't heroin. And we asked people to point out, well, we used paint swatches, and we said, what is the kind of heroin you're using now? This is the diversity of heroin colors that we got. And you think, well, why is this important? Because the change in color and composition of the street drug is profoundly disturbing to the user. Just like those of us with our caffeinated beverages, we like a certain style and a certain type, certain brand maybe, all right? We're fussy. So are the heroin users. And this heroin is becoming unpredictable because of the fentanyl. It's coming in as a poison, as a contaminant. It comes in 60 different varieties, all chemical analogs, all with different potencies. And these potencies and these mixtures and this unpredictability is what we hypothesize. And this is where qualitative research shines, is in developing hypotheses. It's these, the vicissitudes that are causing the overdose risk. So what's the answer? Test the lettuce. 
right? We need to do drug checking. We need to treat the fentanyl crisis as a poisoning epidemic, not as a drug, new drug craze. This is not ecstasy. This is an undesired drug in the drug stream. And if we treated it like a food um, contamination crisis, we would know the answers within weeks, sometimes days, right? Where's the contaminated lettuce coming from? What version of E. coli is in it? What toxicological contaminant is in it, right? And we can do that in this crisis as well. And so whether it's lowbrow stuff like fentanyl test strips or highbrow stuff like this Alpha Brooker spectrometer, I've been involved in a number of projects around the country rolling these things out. Uh, Alpha Brooker is currently running in Chicago in the harm reduction program there. I hope, I expect that we'll see some benefits from these programs. Now, this is what we call harm reduction. Harm reduction was once controversial because if we, people felt like it was aiding and abetting drug use. It's now accepted. It's policy in many countries. What is harm reduction? Let's help keep people alive, prevent the worst consequences of drug use, while maximally maintaining their dignity. That's harm reduction. It's prevention. And prevention sits alongside with treatment. This is not in opposition to treatment. In fact, the best substance use programs have harm reduction as their underlying philosophy, as part of their practices. What else are we learning? We're learning that people are adapting to fentanyl, right? I'll tell you a story about Pops. Older guy, or in the south side of Chicago. He's been using heroin for 40 years. I love the old timers, full of wisdom. The guy's a survivor. And I go, Pops, how do you stay safe with fentanyl out there? He doesn't like the fentanyl. It's too brash, it's too strong, it's, it's itchy makes his skin crawl. He prefers the warm and fuzzy of heroin. Pops, how do you stay safe? He goes, I toot his taste. I go, huh? Toot his taste? And he walks me through it. How He puts a small amount in his nose. And from there, he can tell whether it's heroin. He can tell whether it's fentanyl. He can just dis discern it. He, tells, he can tell whether it's weak, strong, or too strong. And if it's too strong, he knows what to do. He has choices he can make. We asked a whole bunch of other people, what do you do to stay safe? And they'll say, well, I do a tester shot, half the volume, I dilute my shot, I go slow. I go slow, I stay in control. And we like this, we had so many stories, we like this so much, we wrote a paper. Toots, tastes, and tester shots, harm reduction strategies in the age of fentanyl. Go check it out. This is what Be More Power is doing with it. This is an advocacy group in, in Baltimore, working with Johns Hopkins communication team. Go slow. Fentanyl is here. It's awareness and a single doable action in one. This is good public health messaging. What's causing waves upon waves of drug problems in America? Everywhere we go, we see evidence of structural violence. In the Quaker sense, we bear witness to pain. We see the abandoned part of town. We see the boarded up schools and factories. The abandoned and boarded up buildings everywhere, every city. We see the neglected playgrounds. We see the structural violence. We see how policing is used to control people as in a way to address poverty and drug use. We see the violence and we see the community's response to that violence. Stop killing your brother. We see the divisions in society, the cracks, the fault zones, and we see how drugs fall into those cracks. We witness collective pain, and we see that the drugs are collective self-medication. And so if we want to stop the drug deaths, and we want to be a healthier country, we need, we must address structural violence. We must advocate for social justice and reduce inequality. This is an epidemic of crisis proportion. It's also a crisis with epic opportunity. HIV was brought down to manageable levels through adequate funding of treatment and prevention. We could do the same thing. Building trust, telling stories, bearing witness, fighting stigma, advocating for social justice. This is how you do drugs research right. Thank you so much.